But you also need to experience the life-changing power of his love and grace in your life. Amen. Through the revelation, we will see that no matter the struggles, the storms, or the brokenness we may face, Jesus is a common wings over the waters. He can bring healing, restoration, hope. He can bring hope. Amen. Jesus become part of our lives, his story, transforming everything in his presence. That's why it's important to be in the presence of God. That's why praise and worship is such an important, integral part of our service. Because when you're in the presence of the monona yasayan and the honoya, he breaks and loose. He brings transformation. He brings you peace in the midst of storm. He stops the, and calms the water. But that's what happens when you're in the presence of his majesty. And that's why it's important to know who he is. Do you know who I am? This morning we're going to go to Matthew 16. We're going to do NLT. When Jesus came to the re region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Why is he asking his disciples, who do you think they're telling you? I am. Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Again, he's asking his disciple now, who do you say I am? As disciples of Christ, we should already know who he is. But sometimes we forget who the master is to us. So he has to remind us and ask a question. Who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. And I will give you the keys of the heaven, the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidding in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. Then he sternly warned the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. First of all, 
People out there might not know who Christ is. They are looking at us as a reflection of who Christ is because we're in the house. As a disciple of Christ, when you go out there, you need to reflect who Jesus is. And a father told Simon Peter, you are the Mas when he answered Christ and said that you are the Messiah, the son of the living God, Jesus replied, you're blessed. We are blessed because if we can recognize who Jesus is in our life, who he is, that he is the Messiah in our lives, we're blessed. Because in just the name and the mention of Jesus brings power. It brings power and authority. So when we know that our Heavenly Father is with us, we can speak and things change. That's why the scripture goes down and it says, what you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. What you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. You know how powerful that is? When we speak the name of Jesus that we command things to flee, it has no authority in heaven. It diminishes and it crumbles at the feet of Jesus. But that's what happens. That's what the word says. No weapons formed against us shall prosper. All that rise up against us shall fall. But you can't know that because if you don't know who Jesus is, you don't know who he is, he, that he is the great I am, you would not know the power of his name. You know what powerful keys that is that we possess in our hands? That we can lock things up here on earth and it's locked up in heaven. Or we can release things here on earth and it releases in heaven. That's a blessing. That's a blessing. But you can't know that if you can't recognize who Jesus is. Who he is in your life. Which brings me to key number one. Who do you say I am? The question when you ask yourself, who do you say I am? It's fundamental for every believer. It's the same question Jesus posed to his disciples and a question that each of us must answer personally. My answer of who Jesus is to me is not the same answer that you will give who Jesus is to you. I know who he is to me. I know that when I release something in earth, I release healing, it is done in the name of Jesus. All you folks know what I've been going through the past five months earlier this year. But I know that the God that I worship, he is the great I am. He is my healer. And he had healed and restored me. Because I know who he is. He is to me. And I'm going to share this testimony because I just went to um, the doctors the other day. My doctor, my PP, PPC or whatever it is, primary care physician, PCP. She told me that I had this certain thing. So she sent me to a specialist. I go, the devil is a liar. I said, all right, we're going to do this. So I went on to Queens. My sister took me, and I'm not a morning person anymore. I have to wake up at 4 o'clock. If you guys know me, do not wake me up before 7.30 because I'm going to be grouchy. I was a little grouchy because I had to wake up at 4 to get ready to go to Queens downtown. But I went. I showed up. I went down. I had to take x-rays multiple places. And the Spirit of God tested me. I, went, I met this lady, the technician, and she wasn't kind. She was not kind at all because of who I am, my big, my size, right? But I said, Jesus, you better get her because today I have to be kind to her. I woke up 4 o'clock this morning, God, you better get her. I said, you said, I know who you are in my life. You better get this lady because I'm about to squish her between the x-ray technician equipment. And she twisted my neck. I go, how do you expect me to stand up? I'm a big girl. She wanted me to fit my toes like this, my knees together, I go. And the line between, she telling me, I go, you know what? How about you do one leg at a time, trying to get two of my legs on this little screen? And sister, I said, God, you better show up for me. I said, you said that you would never let my face be confounded before the faces of men, you better show up for me right now. Because I'm about to knock this lady out. But God. Because I knew he is, and I knew the authority that I have when I mentioned his name, when I said, God, I need you. Father, I need you to fight on my behalf because this lady trying to make my face shame. And I ain't going to let her make my face shame. You better fit this two knees inside this x-ray, my legs and everything, because I'm about to smash her. And God showed up for me. He showed up for me, and he silenced my mouth. But that's how, have to be. that's how we have to be lights of this world. We have to know who God is for us. We gotta know that he's gonna fight on our behalf because no weapons is formed against us and it will not prosper if we are a child of God. I said, Father, you are 
the man of this house. This house. You are my God. And when I walk, Father God, I walk in your anointing. Even though my flesh is trying to arrive, I said, flesh, you ain't winning today because I have to be kind to people. Because I don't know who knows that I'm a pastor and I have to be kind. Because I cannot be reflecting the darkness if I claim that I'm in the light. But that's a small example of the power of God that when you call upon his name, when you know who he is, he shows up for you. So that's one part of part two. So then after my x-ray, I got to go up to go see the doctor now. So the stuff that my PCP wanted me to go see the specialist for, all these years she tells me that I have this thing. And it's an autoimmune disease that cannot be curable. So I took all the blood tests, I went to take x-ray, I go see the specialist. He go, ma'am, I've never had one wrong diagnosis in all the years that I've been a specialist. And what she said that you have, we do not have. Yeah. And he looking at me because I wasn't shocked, right? I go, thank you, Jesus. I said, that's the power of my God. Yeah. I go, are you sure of your thing? He said, I've never been wrong. I'm 99.9%. .9%. I said, all right, I'll take that. And I said, so no medication needed? No medication needed. Yeah. Because a medication, if I gave it to you for something that you don't have, it'll destroy your, your body. I said, my God is faithful because he knew I didn't want to take medication. I said, I eat healthy. I eat clean. I don't want to take medication that I don't have to. I said, I might be a big girl, but I don't have to take diabetes pills. I don't have to take any, any other medication for high blood pressure, no cholesterol. I said, and I, was a, I didn't want to take anything for the disease. My doctor said that I had. But when you know who he is, when you know that he's your Messiah, when you know that he is Yahweh, when you know that he is the green I am, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, there is no question in your mind that he will show up for you. Amen. Just like he showed up for his disciples. Matthew 16, 13 to 17, as we read, they recognized who he was because he was the son of the living God. And the revelation wasn't given to them by him, but the revelation was given by his father. And it's critical because if it wasn't for who he was and our personal relationship with him and our personal encounters with him, we wouldn't know who Jesus is. But we know who Jesus is in our life. Matthew 21 to 20 it says therefore go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teach these new disciples to obey all my commandments i have given you and be sure of this i am with you always even to the end of age when you recognize who christ is and he's living in your life you are now disciples of the king your disciples that's why I said when I walked in there, I said, God, you better show up for me because I'm about to walk up my this lady for being prejudiced because I'm a woman of size. But when you walk in authority in Jesus Christ, that doesn't matter. Whether you're skinny or big, it doesn't matter. What matters is if you are a reflection of the King. When you walk in discipleship that He had called you to be, you know the authority that you have because you know who He is. When you recognize and you operate these things in your life, knowing that Jesus, when you recognize who Jesus is in your life, your life changes. You no longer, I'm no longer Kimberly Jeremiah. I am the daughter of the king. When we truly know this, everything in our life changes. That's why I gave my testimony. One thing I was diagnosed all this time, she tells me, and then I see the specialist, boom. Like they said, boom, Kanani, it's all gone. No can find, no can find. Sorry, my pigeon ain't that great. Like I remember I said the last time I said, oh, what is that? I was trying to figure out, and I said, no scared. My sister had to tell me it was no scared. And I was like, no scared? No, I, I don't know. But anyways, it says, Bukanani is gone. But it unlocks spiritual power. We don't fight in the physical realm. We fight in the spiritual realm. That's why my niece, in a way, there were some things going on and they said, what are you doing? I said, we don't fight by our words. We fight in a spiritual realm. Yeah. 
There's no thing that we need to worry about because as long as we fight in the spiritual realm, our Father fights on our behalf. But that's because you need to know who He is in your life. Then you can fight in the spiritual realm on our knees praying. Praying. Father, you know all things. He can go before you and in the back of us. He knows we're predestined. He knows our future. But what are we going to do about it? Acknowledge who he is or deny who he is and the power there is. But all these things he transforms and he brings healing to our body. He brings healing to our mind. There's, he rebukes every anxiety that we have. Because I went in there knowing that I can, God, whatever your will. That's why when before when I went to the testing for cancer, I told God this. I said, God, if you want me to go through chemotherapy, if you want me to have cancer, I will do your work. If you need to use me to show others that the power of your healing is upon me because of you, I will wait to go through chemotherapy. And I was faithful to God. And I kept calling and knowing who he was in my life. And the time comes, the final testing come back. There's nothing. No chemotherapy. But I'm not sharing this to repeat myself. I'm re be sharing this because that's the power of God. When we submit ourselves, when we have to go through something horrible that we think is horrible in our life, God uses those things for beautiful things. What we think that was sent for us for evil, God turns it around and makes it for good. We are the examples of who he is as long as we acknowledge who he is in our life. And how do you apply this in your life? Personal encounters versus secondhand faith. How many of you secondhand faiths in here? Yeah. Going off the feet of your kupunas, going off the feet of your mom or your dad. Sometimes we do that. We hitchhike off of them. But when you have a personal encounter with Christ and we know who He is, there is no secondhand faith because our faith will be strong in Him. Yeah. We don't have to do secondhand faith of our kupunas calling, you know, my mom. God bless her. People used to call her all the time, Mom, in prayer. Mom, no matter what time, Mom, Mom, Mom. And then they like, try to call me now. Because my mom's not here. I just want you folks to ask me who you are. I just, I said, you know what, I'm not my mom, but I can lead you to Christ. Mom, Ma, Ma is not here. Ma is in heaven. She has got, gained her reward. But they tried to do secondhand faith, right, because of my mom. But they wasn't looking at the person that was living in my mom, which is Christ. So now that mom is not here, you got to go straight to Jesus. So that's not secondhand faith anymore. We got to go firsthand faith, personal encounter with Christ. But when we know and we have the relationship with Christ, it's unbreakable. Nobody can tell you anything because nobody can tell me anything that what my God cannot do. Because I know for a fact that my personal encounter with him proved to me that he never leaves me. Yeah. That he's my healer. He's my provider. That's why we sing the song, Jaira, you are enough. And he is enough for us. He is enough for us. Okay, Jesus, my computer, not let go of it. But it impacts our lives when there's a transformation. So that now when storms come our way, in moments of our weakness, we know who to call. We know who he is in our lives. That's why Peter, his boldness transformed him. And he in Acts 2, he stood among thousands of people. He was bold, declaring who Jesus was. And 3,000 people were saved, and the power of recognizing Jesus was seen that day. We're going to go to key number two. Enough about who Jesus is by now. You should know who he is, right? We talked about it for some time right now. You know who he is. And he's evident in your life. So key two is the servant king. Jesus, the servant king. There's a lot of people in this world that like position. They like the title. I told one of the praise and worship people team members when I came back from my trip in Oregon a couple weeks ago. I told them, you know what the problem is? The problem with you and the team 
and anybody else in Jesus Christ, we have to remember that we have to be servant and we have to serve before we can have our title. Having a title of who you are, whether deacon, pastor, deaconess, greeter, praise and worship leader, musician, titles in the church, means nothing if you cannot serve. And this is proven with point two, Jesus the servant king. He served dual roles. That was the most impactful thing about his identity, that he was a king, but not only a king, but a king that was a servant. How awesome is that? And you know, my dad used to demonstrate that to me and my sisters when we were growing up. He was a manager, an operations manager for the Honolulu Point Company, which turned into HPC Foods. Operation, second man to the owner. But he was a man that was a servant. He would jump on the trucks when his boys for help them, to help him to deliver. He didn't have to, but he used to do that. And because he was a servant before he became a leader, well, while being a leader, he got the respect of the boys that was under him. <laughs> to the point where anything fell on the ground, well, pen, they're running over there to pick him up. But that's because he got the respect because they knew he was a servant first. And not he, the boss of them. But he was a servant and was willing to serve on behalf and with the boys that was in the world. They weren't boys, they were men, but he called them his boys. They were like his sons. But that's examples of being a servant king. And that's what Jesus did for us. True greatness comes from humility and love. Humility and love. Philippians 2, 6 to 8 says, Who being in very nature, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing but taking the very nurture of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. How awesome is that? The identity of Christ. He lowered himself to be a servant, willing to die for you, you and I. Jesus didn't come to be served. How many of us like to be served? I'm called the bougie auntie. Because I don't like Airbnbs. And do not give me any hotels with cockroaches. <laughs> because I will be a very unhappy person. But Jesus didn't care he was born in a manger. Out there. In the hay. But he was born that way. And I'm not saying that I'm not a servant and I'm not ready to serve because by all means I am. But if I have the money to stay in a hotel I want to, I am going to stay in that hotel. Do not put me in an Airbnb. Because I, I literally will turn around real quick. And I'm not saying that's bad. There's some reasons, reasons why I don't like them. Because I'm a woman of size. I'm a big girl. And nothing wrong with being a big girl. Because when you're a big girl, we're the best. When you got curves. But because of that, I don't like taking, what do you call that? I don't like staying in places that I am unfamiliar with. I want to stay somewhere that I am comfortable and I, it's clean. No roaches. Knowing that the sheets is clean. I follow this lady on Instagram, like, her name is Nikki something. She, she crazy. She be taking all these little bags and they get all this gloves and she scrub the tub and everything. I ain't that crazy, but I do need to know that my sheets are clean, so you know that little UV thing. You take that on your trip for the sheets, because I ain't that crazy to pack. Okay, so I already packed my luggage already close, and the luggage I have is aluminum, so it's a little heavier than the regular luggage. So in addition to that 12 pounds in my luggage, I only have 50 less 12 to pack. And Pastor Kim packs a lot of, a lot of stuff. To the point that sometimes we carry an extra bag because I have to take some things out. But it helps me not to shop. But um, anyways, I like to shop, but I also like to be a humble person. Humble. I like to, I like to serve. As big as a woman that I am, nobody has any excuse because if I can serve, 
anybody can. I serve him because I know who he is in my life. I serve him because he is the example to me to serve people. So no matter how much pain I might have been in, no matter, no matter, I'm willing to serve in any capacity that he has for me. That's why my sister was like, you really weren't, I'm really weren't. She go, oh, before I can say anything, wait, you're supposed to bring more than I want yes. I said, God, if you can use anything, you can use me. But you know, our God is so faithful. Went on a cross, whipped, bruised, dragged across all that way, still serve. What more? What excuses do I have? There is no limitation physically that can stop you in the spiritual realm. Nobody can tell me that I don't have money, that I cannot do this, that I cannot serve in ministry. I stand here today knowing that when you have zero in your bank account and you are up against the wall, God shows up. He shows up. When your electric bill is $1,200 and you have zero dollars in your checking account, God will show up. As long as we be wise in our spending, God shows up for us. I know the power of Christ. I know that he shows up. When my parents died, there's a lot of things that I have to pay for that I didn't have to pay for before. But I said, God, for whatever reason this is, that you put this in my life and I have to pay all this, I know that you will make a way. I know God give, doesn't give us anything that we cannot handle. Because he already designed it in our path. He designed it that way. Because you and I are testimonies. So when we serve, we become testimonies to other people. Just like Christ is a testimony to us of his goodness and his love. That wasn't on my notes, but it's okay. And this is another example of how Jesus served. John 13, 14 to 15. It says, now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. Jesus modeled servant leadership. And when he recognized him, when we recognize him as our king, we are called to serve others. This is power and humility. And it's through serving others that we experience the fullness of God's kingdom. You know, everyone knows that the feet is the dirtiest part, right? Because it drags on dirt, it drags on grass, it drags on mud, rocks. Dirtiest part of our body. But Jesus sat there and washed their feet. How humble is that? What a servant that is. But that's the example that he leaves for you and I. That we're not high and mighty that we cannot serve. And it's an important part of our spiritual journey to serve. And how does that apply to us? We are called to serve like Jesus. When we follow his example, the world often views greatness for power. Greatness is power. You and I have greatness. And when we have greatness, which is the key, it gives us power. It gives us power and might. And it influences people. And like Jesus, he flipped it upside down. He flipped the table. He showed that true greatness comes from serving others. When we serve, we reflect Jesus' heart and character. How many of you know Jesus' heart? Do you know his heart and the character that he possesses? Just like how do you know the heart of your pastor? When you know the heart of your pastor, it should be the heart after Christ. But when you lead in service, you soar. I started off as a loan officer and a credit union way back when. My first job actually was in mortgage lending. I never went to college right after high school. I went later on in life, but who does that? I went from zero jobs my whole life, only working at the school as a, uh, for a CPA to a mortgage servicing officer. But throughout my path, I served. 
And God elevated me all the way to a position on an executive team on Joint Base Point of America. I was the director of finance and human resources. This Hawaiian was among military people. I was the only Hawaiian that worked for my company until we brought other people in because we needed stability because, you know, military in and out. But I was the only local that represented my company. But God used me, a Hawaiian girl, to dwell in a community of military people that are white, prominently white that was in our division. But he used me and he can use you. But that's how being a servant elevates you and soars you to heights that you could never ever imagine. Now I work for NASA. I got smarter. I cried to Jesus, God, I'm done with this. I got my title, I got this, I got that, I experienced this, and I'm done, I'm tired, of beaten. God gave me a real job now I work from home. But it doesn't mean that I didn't excel. God taught me a new way of thinking. He told me if you put your trust in me, I will draw all men to you. And now I sit among people from NASA, the most brilliant people, all the scientists. And it's so exciting because I can shine my light for Christ. And as I serve, they can see who he is in my life. But when we go in purpose, there's joy and a deeper connection and relationship that we get with Christ. Just like how the disciples, Jesus corrected them by saying in Luke 22, 24, that they started arguing among themselves about who was greater. That's what happens to us sometimes, right? See, me and my sister, we have a special relationship. We have Pastor Steve. We don't argue about who is greater. That's one of the things that I appreciate about appreciate about our relationship. We have some people talking to us about, you know, a will. My sister has a heart to serve. It doesn't matter, she will serve. She will be in pain, she will serve. She's no snow, team no sleep, but she will still serve. No matter how she's feeling, that's no question. When it comes to Christ, she will serve. Doesn't matter. But I appreciate our relationship because you know why? We don't argue about anything. In fact, when my dad was putting names on his house, I said, I don't want your house. I think she mentioned that in a message. She said that my sister was planning a movie to Texas. She said, I was planning a movie to Texas. But the bottom line to my story is that there's never an argument between us. There's no, we don't fight for whose position it is in our family. We don't fight about the money, about my parents, the house, nothing. There's no argument. And when we are a family of God, there should be no arguments between the both of us. You and I, none of us should be arguing. None of us should be jealous of anything. There's no jealousy between my sister and I. As we all know, we're opposite. I'm the bougie one and she ain't. My sister is like, hands down dirty. She will get involved, not me over here. I'm allergic. My neck is itchy. <laughs> Anybody give Benadryl? <laughs> that is who I am. But I can serve in other, other capacities. But getting my hands down and dirty is not one of them. I get my mind that I use to get ministry things that we need. But bottom line to this story is that there is never an argument about placement in anything. If anything, I'm trying to give her stuff. If anything, she's trying to give me stuff, and I'm like, uh-uh, that's you, bro. But no argument. And then this family that was telling us about their will, you know, um, families are fighting for property. They're fighting among division of who deserves this, who deserves that, but that's not how God designed us to be. We are family. We're supposed to be knitly together perfectly. That there's, we're under, the bond is unbreakable. Why are we fighting with each other? Why are we jealous of each other? Because when I look at my sister, she's a reflection of who I am. Not the same way, but she's from my bloodline. This is my sister by blood. And I have a sister that's not by blood. Well, she's by blood, but not maybe from the same parents. But she's my sister. When we graft, engrafted in a, the house of worship, when we engrafted in Christ, we are blood. Doesn't matter if we don't share the same DNA because we do share the same DNA in Christ. So why are we jealous of each other? Why are we trying to compete? We're supposed to be pulling up each other. 
And we're supposed to be serving together. Serving. Serving our community, serving our people, serving Christ the most high. But there should be no argument of rank. No argument of rank. No jealousy because there is a rank. That's what the scripture said in 22. Those who are the greatest among you should take the lowest rank and the leader should take should be like a servant. This is a scripture. I ain't making this up. And when we follow the word of God, this is an instruction man for our life. It works. You know, we all try and do the self-help books, right? We go and online, they're so deceiving. How you can make this money going on to social media? You can make $50,000 a month if you just buy my book. They give you a little teaser and they give you like maybe five steps. But then you can join my thingy and I can give you the rest by paying $29.99. But we have God who designed the manual for life. God can bring you success. Whatever you're asking for, if you're servants and we know who he is in our life, he will bring you success. He'll bring it knocking at your door. And he did that for me, so I know it works. I ain't gonna tell you a fishing tale when I know that it works. He will bring it right to your door. But sometimes we have to surrender and submit, submit ourselves to him in order for us it to be activated in our lives. And sometimes that's hard, you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty strong-headed woman. And I had to learn the law. It took me a long time to submit something that I had no control over to give it to God so that he can take control. And the minute I did that, he worked on my behalf quickly, immediately, and it was done. Point number three is walking in revelation and miracle. Knowing Jesus unlocks miraculous things. I mentioned some things of miracles in my, my personal life, but that's something small to something greater that he can do. When we recognize who Jesus is, we open the doors to experiences of his supernatural power in our lives. You know, growing up in our Sunday school class, I anticipate the inevitable supernatural intervention of God. I always remember that song. And you know, and as it goes on, and Pastor Simeon was singing it, I expect the miracle. And when I was a little girl, I'll be like, and we're going and singing the same song for Sunday school. We've got to come up in front of everybody in the church to Sunday school kids and singing the same song. But you know how impactful those songs were? We went to talk about our books used to be green, but now our books is blue, the hymn books. We used to go, page 10, there is power, power, wonder work, power in the blood. We knew the, the page, 141. We knew the page numbers by heart. We used to always sing and we started laughing, right? And I was a girl of my grandma's heart, so I sat in the first row. Oh, next to my grandma, I was her OPG. But those hymns got us through some pretty tough times. Those things when we were growing up, although we were young and didn't understand, it brought us through some, some crazy things in our lives. Because when, you, when you're up against the, the wall, oh, all the things that you were growing up, oh, come to memory. And now, when my mom is no longer here, my grandma, they all left. But the teachings that they instilled in us still lives on today. You cannot look at me and my sister and not know who we belong to. We belong to Pastor Kialan, Majo. We belong to Pastor Ruben and Nina, Grandma Nina. But you cannot say and deny the fact that they, we came from them because their teaching, their way of living is instilled in us. And I'm proud to say that I belong to them. Because when there's a strong foundation in your life, you're unmovable. You cannot move, the devil cannot move you. You stand still and you see the salvation of Christ. And that's why walking in the revelation of miracle, if we have a spiritual foundation in him, we know who he is and we become servant and willing to serve, he can show us how to walk in revelation and miracles. John 14, 12, it says, Very truly, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So Jesus is leaving his disciples now, but he's leaving back a legacy that you will be greater than me. Greater than me. Our parents and grandparents left us a legacy, but we are going to be greater than them. Doesn't mean that we're gonna supersede them and we wanna be greater, 
but God has greater works for us than he had for them. Their work was done, so they went home to glory, but God has greater things in store for us. That's why we're here. And he's doing the same in your life. God has greater things that he wants for you and I. Because this scripture challenges us to believe that the same power that worked in Jesus can work in us today, recognizing Jesus as the miracle worker. He's a miracle worker, a promise keeper, like that song that we sing. He, he keeps his promises. God never lies. He never fails. But he allows us to walk in faith, expecting him to move in our lives and through us to touch others. When we truly know who Jesus is, we begin to walk in the same power he demonstrated. That's why I pray in the morning when I wake up. I blood cover myself, my sister, and those that are connected to me, including the church. And I, I always say, God, help us to walk in the power of your word. Because just the mention of Jesus, things change. That is power. But then I pray that all the time for our church and all my loved ones near and far, that God allows them to walk in a part of him because we have a duty to do for him and that's to serve. Just like the woman, the woman with the issue of blood, and it's a familiar thing, scripture to us, Matthew 5, 25 to 34, it talked about the woman with the issue of blood, how she stepped out in faith. Why did she step out in faith? Because she knew who he was. She knew that the great I am was in her presence. And no matter how filthy she was, she made it a point to touch the hem of his garment. And when she did that, her life was transformed. She was healed, blood stopped. The issue of her blood stopped immediately when she touched the hem and recognized his power. But then it also took her faith to get there. Sometimes our faith isn't that great. But let me share with you this morning that no matter how small your faith, the word says as if it's small as a mustard seed, that is all the faith that you need, because that's pretty tiny. It's like a chia seed, real tiny. But that's all the faith that you need. And God can transform your life because of the power of who he is. So when we approach Jesus in faith, knowing who he is, we open ourselves to experience his miraculous touch. How many of you have been touched by the power of God? Because when he touches you, it transforms your body. Because this big girl and the power of God is on me, I will dance as David dance. You wouldn't have known that my knee is hurting sometimes or I cannot breathe because my asthma is acting up because I would dance as they can dance. There's no such thing when the anointing is upon you. There's nothing that can touch you. Nothing. No physical element of this world can touch you when the anointing is on you. But it's a power so strong that you just want to be in his presence all the time. When the anointing of God is on me so powerful, that's all I want to be is standing right down in the showers because there is a fire that's just burning in my soul. And from the top of my feet, I mean the top of my head to the soles of my feet, I'm just on fire for Christ. The anointing is so strong, it removes barriers. But that's the anointing that we have to seek every day. But you can't get there if you don't know what he is. Faith unlocks miracles. Like they said, Mark 5, 25, 34. She reached out and touched the garment. And Jesus asked who she was, and she never lied to him. So if you're going through some things, don't lie to Christ. Acknowledge the things that you're going to to him because he's your Savior. If you know who he is and recognize who he is in your life, that will be changed. Miracles didn't stop in the Bible. Jesus is the same then, yesterday, today, and forever. That's what Hebrews 13, 8 said. When we recognize Jesus as a miracle worker, we can expect him to move in our lives. He restores relationships. If you have a broken relationship with your, your family, a friend, God can mend that. If you need healing because you have sickness, he's your healer. And when you need provision in time of need, he's your provider. God is still working miracles to today. However, it requires us to see him clearly 
believe in his power and walk in faith. Acts 3, 6 to 8. It talked about Peter and John healing a crippled man at the temple gate. But then they healed him in the power of Jesus' name. When we walk in the revelation of Jesus, we carry his power and we can see miracles in our own lives and the lives of those that we encounter. That's why when we lay hands on the sick, they shall be covered. I believe that. I believe that when he healed, my nephew one time he had something on his leg and he was supposed to go to the emergency. I told my sister, we got the oil, I laid my hand on his leg, I said, do you believe in God? I said, do you believe with your whole heart that Jesus can heal you? He said, yes, Auntie. So I said, because if you believe, God is going to heal you right now. We lay our hands on his leg, and he was healed immediately. But that's not because of us. That's because of the power that resides in us, and that's the power of Jesus Christ. It brings healing immediately. And sometimes when things take too long, look at me. I go, Jesus, when am I going to get married? All my nieces and nephews getting married before me. I'm like 47 years old. I'm about to be 50. I said, God, what, what I never learned yet, God? What I never learned all these years that you're trying to make me learn? I still have to wait on you. Because what I want is not necessarily what he wants. He took my man. He took my man all the way to the East Coast. Two years later, he's still trying to come back and he cannot come back. The military is still no more opening for him to come back. I say, God, whatever your will is. Sometimes God gotta break us through some things that doesn't belong to us. And he gotta work on our behalf. If he's for me, God will turn him around. But I ask God that sometimes. When things are not going immediately, because the worst is that God works immediately, especially if you have faith. And I'm saying this to encourage you that sometimes you might be praying for something that you didn't even get yet. But that's because God is trying to teach you something. Ask him. That's why I ask him. When it happens to me, I go, God, what am I supposed to learn that I didn't see? God, what do you want me to see that I'm not seeing? I humble myself and I ask him that. And then I continue to trust in him, knowing that he has an answer for me that I cannot see. I go, okay, God, break my spirit. Because maybe I'm too strong-headed and thinking that, oh, God, this is for me. But if God is not meant to be, God is not going to work on me after you get me. So I said, okay, God, I guess I'm married to you for now. I said, well, I don't want to have any kids. <laughs> Too bushy for the bed. I don't know if you can afford it, but anyway, it's not necessary. Kirsten's baby came over. I was like, God, I definitely cannot have any kids at this I cannot. I cannot afford to pack for me. Pack me. Pack a kid. Yeah. Realization was like, I missed my gate a long time ago. I was engaged years ago. And that door closed. My mom was a wolf to that one too, so that she wouldn't happen. <laughs> Never last time she for your out of my life. But I'm just saying, <laughs> no, what happened back then is not going to happen for me now. And I said, told my sister, this is just the other day. I go, God. I said, listen, I told God, God, if I get pregnant, I'm going to cry the rest of my life. <laughs> I said, I'm going to cry so much to my own pregnancy. Now, I don't know if you guys want to hear me. I am going to cry. And it wouldn't be tears of joy. It would be tears of sorrow. <laughs> and don't get me wrong, you know, children are a blessing if that's for you. And if God bless you with them, thank you, Jesus. But this pastor right here, I'm good. I'm good, good. I like the step ones when they're older, yeah. Because if we had a son that was 24, okay, you can call me Auntie Mama because I'm good with that. You handle your own business. I don't have to do anything for you. But anyways, getting back to this word. God is an almighty God and the miracles that he can perform in your life is unbelievable. It's unbelievable. But one thing that I want to remind everyone is about true repentance and a renewal of your heart. True repentance comes from recognizing Jesus for who he is. Peter, who once denied Jesus, later preached repentance to others. Repentance is not just about sorrow, but about realigning our hearts to Jesus' purpose for our lives. 
When we see Jesus clearly, we understand our need for him. And that realization leads us to repentance and transformation. I know sometimes you hear about repentance. Repentance is not a bad thing. And you don't, you don't have to tell the whole world what you're repenting for. There's only one person that you have to repent to, and that's Jesus Christ. Amen. And it's important for me, I'm always asking God to search my heart and forgive me. Because I want to make heaven my home. One wrong move that I made, one word, one wrong eye twitch that could sever my ties going to heaven. So I always search my heart and repent. And I ask God to give me a renewed heart and a renewed mind. But sometimes we have to remember to do that. Ask him for forgiveness. There's nothing that we should be ashamed of. God knows our past. He knows our future. He knows what we're currently going through right now. So why hide? You know, our family always told the truth no matter how harsh it was to our family. Whether they, we feel that they hate our guts, whether they're picking us up from prison. I mean, not prison, but jail. <laughs> whether they're picking us up from the emergency or the hospital. We never lied to our parents. But those are the things that we had in our past because God knew that we had a greater future in Him. So never be ashamed of where you came from. Never be ashamed of what you have to experience in, in your life. There's nothing too hard, too difficult, too terrible, too horrible for God. He forgives all things as long as we come to true repentance to Him. And we know who He is in our life and who God is. Who do we call Him? How do we serve like Him? But that's the God that we worship. He's just a forgiving God and He changes things. Just the mention of His name. Just like the Samaritan woman in John 4, 28, 29. Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Her encounter with Jesus didn't change her life, just changed her life. It impacted her community. When we know Jesus, our testimony becomes a tool to spread the good news and transform people's lives around us. It doesn't just stay in here. It transforms lives out in our community. And now people in our community here on the west side are so frightened. They're scared to do things with their families. They think they're scared to go out in a public some places. Going out to community events sometimes is hard for them because they're afraid of what's going on. But we are commissioned to go out there and to share the love of Jesus Christ. So what more can we do but spread the gospel? And let them know that they have a hope in Jesus Christ. That they don't have to worry about their family. All they have to do is plead the blood of Jesus and know that the blood of Jesus, Satan, he's against you. That's why we sing the song so much. Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. And we hear it so often. Apostle says that all the time. About, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. Because that works. When you say Satan, you have no authority in the name of Jesus. I command you to flee. He's gone. When he's telling me about the black man, black man in her house, they saw, or somebody seen. I said, that's no good. I said, you better fix yourself because a black man come. And it's not about race. Growing up, the Hawaiians used to call, you know, the spirit city see black man, right? Because you see the shadow on the wall. But I'm here to tell you that when you see that black man in your house, you rebuke him in the name of Jesus. So one of us said, I don't know if it wasn't girl or one guy. I go, I don't care what sex that you thought it was. It was black shadow on your wall. I said, that's Satan. I said, I come against you in the name of Jesus, Satan. You have no authority in this house. That's what you got to do. Don't be afraid to use the name of Jesus. Because he has no authority living in your house. And if he's in your house, you better fix something. Because you allow that spirit to come into your house. Because when we sanctify your house and we bless every corner, there's no room for the devil to come in. But I'm giving you the keys this morning. You better listen and use it. When the, when the spirit of the enemy and heaviness come upon you, you say, Satan, the blood of Jesus is against you. We all grew up knowing that. When the, the devil is choking at night in your bed, know who he is. Jesus, I come before you, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. Satan has no authority to take you, you while you're sleeping. Because when the blood covering of Jesus Christ is over you, he has no authority to touch your body. 
But when he's over there up against you, choking you, and you cannot breathe, and you cannot say a word, inside of you, all you say, the blood of Jesus, and an enemy will flee. But that's the power of the name of Jesus. Days are not getting easier living in this world. There's a lot of distractions going around for our youths, even for our adults. There's a lot of distraction. People deceiving others on the internet. Catfishing, like they call it. They got all these names. So be careful of who you associate with and know the power of Christ. Seek Him. Seek Him first, and all things will work out for you. So, in conclusion this morning, each of these keys brings us back to the central truth, the only truth. Do you know who Jesus is? When we recognize Jesus as our Savior, our servant King, and a miracle worker who transforms lives, then you're on the right path. I encourage you today to answer this question personally. Who Jesus is to you? Who do you say that I am? When you know him for who he truly is, you will experience his power, walk in his love, and live in the fullness of his miraculous power. I encourage you to encounter Jesus in a deeper, more personal way, allowing him to change your life inside and out. He will never fail you. I promise you that. God never fails. Remember, if you can take this away, remember to acknowledge who he is in your life. Secondly, serve like he did. He was a servant king. And third, remember that he is your miracle worker. And most of all, the most important, his name is power. So when Satan comes against you, plead the blood of Jesus. It works. So I leave you with that to say, who is he to you? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for being a good God. We thank you for your miraculous power, your healing, oh Father God. We thank you for your faith that you increase in each and every one of us, that when we walk, Lord, we may walk in the power of you, oh Father God, that we may know just a mention of your name, demons will flee. Just a mention of name, there is power and authority, Father God. We thank you, Father God, for you are the great I am. You are the king of kings. You are the miracle worker, Father God. You are the king that surpasses all of us. There is no one else other than you, O oh Father God. We put our trust and faith knowing, O oh Father God, that when we have a closer relationship, there is transformation that happens. There is healing that happens, Father God, and wholeness. There is restorations in families, God, restoration in our body of Christ. Resurrection power comes alive, O oh Father God, in us, that we may know, O oh Father God, that we are your servants. Let us serve, O oh Father God, that we may please and honor you, because you are our example. And Lord, we come before you and we ask that you search us. When we miss it, oh, come short of your glory, Father God, I pray that you'll forgive us. Because true repentance brings healing in the name of Jesus. So, Father, we ask that you'll search us. Wash us white as snow. And as we walk, we may walk in victory. Knowing, oh, Father God, that you have answered our prayers. Knowing, oh, Father God, that you are the lover of our lives. The lover of my soul, Father. I give all things and all honor to you. This is our Son, Jesus' name. Jesus is the answer. Sing it with me. For the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. Above him there's no other, Jesus is the way. If you have some questions in the corners of your mind, traces of discouragement and peace you cannot find, reflections of your past seems to face you every day. But this one thing I know for sure is Jesus is the way. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus is the answer for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus.
Jesus is the way. Jesus is the answer. Oh yeah, for the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. that you think you cannot climb and I know sometimes your skies are dark and you think the sun won't shine in case you don't know let me tell you the word of God is true oh, yes, and, and everything he's promised I know he Jesus is the way. Jesus is, Jesus the, answer. is the answer for you and yeah, the world today. Above him there's no other. Jesus is the way. Truth and the Jesus is the way. For joining us here at Ark of Safety Christian Fellowship. Remember, if you're giving your tithes and offering, you can visit us at aoshawaii.com or text the word GIVE to 1-808-518-3793. God bless.